Tonight, we are really proud to welcome Merrill Club, veteran, author, and prof professor emeritus of English at the University of Montana. Uh, he's here this evening to speak to us about his new book, A Life Disturbed, My Pacific War Revisited, told through letters that he himself sent from the Pacific Theater of World War II, A Life Disturbed Explores a Life Forever Changed by War. Uh, please join me tonight in welcoming Merrill Club. Thank you. A Life Disturbed, My Pacific War Revisited, uh, is a kind of then and thou, uh, then and now, <laughs> not thou, but then and now uh, memoir of World War II. And uh, I, re I revisit revisited the war through uh, the eyes of the young man who wrote a bunch of letters, uh, quite a long series of letters, to uh, my parents during the war. And I have revisited the war, re I'm revisiting the war again in the process of writing this book uh, through, the eye, through the mind of an old man, uh, trying to think about what that war was all about, at least to me. Uh, Uh, so what I'm doing is trying to, uh, uh, now to explain what I think about the war in general and to say how it may or may not have affected my life. Uh, by way of background, I was trained in midshipman school for Navy ship duty and not land warfare. But after a short term of duty, uh, as a shore fire control, uh, I mean a shore patrol officer in uh, San Francisco, I was assigned uh, as a naval gunfire liaison officer to Army or Marines for amphibious landings on various islands in the Pacific. And I think that this is probably the only, uh, as far as I know, uh, published description of uh, naval gunfire liaison teams that, that, I, that I know of. Uh, the first battle that I attended was the Battle of Kiska, which was a kind of a fiasco, to say the least, because 35,000 uh, American soldiers and Canadian, well, American and Canadian soldiers uh, landed with uh, some 300 ships in support on Kiska, expecting uh, uh, 10,000 fanatical Japanese. Uh, the, the, an earlier operation had been Attu, which uh, had uh, the Japanese had fought to the last m man, virtually. Uh, almost no, no one was uh, taken prisoner. And uh, so we were expecting quite a lot. It turned out that the Japanese had been withdrawn uh, some three, three weeks before the landing, so that here we had this huge armada of uh, naval ships and all of the uh, Army and uh, both American and Canadian going ashore, and right at first they started shooting at each other, <laughs> and uh, we did. Have, it's, it, it, it's a joke in a way, and uh, we thought so at the time. But uh, well, no, we didn't think so at the time, because of uh, a cemetery had been uh, uh, set up, and they were burying people in the cemetery as a result of those of uh, platoons and companies running into each other. Uh, uh, in the fog. But at any rate, uh, the problem for me in a reading of this sort is that uh, I've, uh, uh, I can understand readings of uh, poetry because poetry has a long, long oral tradition and even now it's uh, written to be uh, recited. But for me at any rate, prose <laughs> at first glance is something that uh, I'm not sure <laughs> one should involve, get involved in reading. But then I, again, I have to think that uh, uh, prose also has a long oral tradition and uh, so that I, don't, I feel a little bit better doing it. But also I have a little problem in reading, uh, 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 reading the letters that I wrote home because I don't much like writing, uh, reading from uh, letters that I wrote to dear mom and daddy mom, <laughs> some uh, 60 years ago. But at any rate, uh, I'll uh, begin by reading from one of those letters anyhow. And uh, from uh, the, 
well, I'm beginning in the middle of one of them. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I just lost it uh, yesterday. Uh, that night we went into a, pr this is on Macon Island. Uh, well, that's not Macon Island, it's uh, Macon Atoll, which is a sort of circular group of islands around a, pl uh, a lagoon. And uh, then, and some of the islands are large enough to be inhabited, so most of them are not. At any rate, uh, the third night, we went into a perimeter defense to, uh, in effect, more than a, uh, a more or less a circle with a diameter stretching from one side of the island to the other and dug in for the night. For the first time, I experienced real terror. About 8 o'clock p.m., we heard a bunch of natives, men, women, and children, talking and coming up the road. A baby was crying, and they were let through the front lines and made to stay in the middle of the CP. Uh, about 10 minutes later, two Japanese walking up the road, talking loudly to each other. Of course, they were shot, and uh, that was the end. Of, that was the signal for the most terrific clatter of machine gun and grenades and uh, automatic rifles I've ever heard, in my, heard or imagined. During an occasional interlude, I could hear the Japs shouting, guard, guard, I'm coming through, or Joe, it's me, I'm wounded, come and get me. In the midst of, uh, all, midst of it all, the baby would cry, a rooster crow, a hit man scream. It was an eerie night. They kept up for 10 hours until dawn, or that did. Bullets flew a few inches above my hole, uh, occasionally knocking dirt uh, into, the, uh, into it, and I only prayed that tomorrow night I might have a chance to dig, the, uh, dig a deeper one. After I got used to the firing, I was lulled by the machine gun fire and was able to sleep uh, uh, very fitfully. The Japs were sackied up, as was shown from their canteens the next morning, and some of them broke through, broke through. One was uh, within about 10 feet of me, one of my men told me, before he was scared off, and I'm glad I didn't know it. The long-awaited and prayed-for dawn, to use a cliche, I didn't, <laughs> uh, finally arrived with uh, soldiers carrying in wounded buddies and orders for stretcher bearers to get forward and to get the more seriously wounded. There were abo about uh, 200 to in the attack, and 100 were counted dead. We lost a few. Uh, the night grayed into day and started raining upon one horrible scene. Men walking around, dazed with the staring eyes, some laughing at high-pitched voices, some sitting staring dumbly or crying out, of co uh, crying out, and of course the usual killer talking of his exploits of shooting and stabbing a man six times before he died. One captain, a pretty close friend of mine, had been in the brunt of the attack. I learned, I learned later that he had stabbed one of his own men, thinking that he was fighting a Japanese. When I saw him, that he had already uh, going to pot with that knowledge on his soul. There were dead and mutilated everywhere, some lying half in foxholes where they had been shot in their charge, others uh, with something white where a, an elbow had been, others staring up at you mutely, questioning, their arms raised as though they were to ward off a blow. They were pale, yellowish-blue color, and the rain pattered down silently. A fly would crawl slowly across the face of one of the dead, and he made, that is, the dead made no effort to brush it away when it must have tickled his nose. It seems strange, and it does now, that the sight of all that death and destruction uh, didn't affect me more. Maybe I was too numbed, or maybe I had to condition myself beforehand. I had wondered before how the sight of a man in a human with a, a human being without a head would affect me. I could stare down at them, looking very much like, I suppose, like the conqueror in a picture you've probably seen, disinterestedly, our own men dead the same way. I can't tell you of all the details of men stabbing with a bayonet 
wounded men because they made, he made too much noise, or of tanks squashing bodies into the roads, or of prisoners being stabbed and shot, uh, shot or the ears being cut off for the souvenirs. Uh, I want to read just a commentary. Well, no, I, yeah, I want to read one more passage from that. No, I want to read the commentary. Uh, when I think back upon the Banzai charge that uh, continued all the third night on Macon, I remember confusion of feelings and thought as I lay w with my head at the apex of the wide V-shaped foxhole I had dug with my corporal, the sound of intense rifle fire uh, and machine gun fire not far away at the outer edge of the perimeter, hand-to-hand -hand fighting going on nearby. Trembling and afraid, I remember thinking it wasn't my war, it wasn't my job as a naval officer to get out of my hold and shoot. It was the job of the soldiers around me. My car being useless for the defense of a foxhole, I lay there in my back trying to sink deeper and deeper into the sand with a knife I had bought in San Francisco held close to my chest. The blade pointed up, up, uh, upwards toward the sky to save me from any Japanese soldier who might have the temerity to jump in on top of me with his sword or bayonet. Joe, my co corporal, whispered every few minutes, club, club, are you all right? Are you still alive? I suppose I would have tried to kill if I'd been forced to, but I still don't know and a feeling that it wasn't my job to be killing people, or perhaps the fear of killing, followed me throughout the war. Part of what I was feeling uh, turned out not to have been uh, particularly unique to me, I learned later. After Iwo Jima, the Iwo Jima campaign in 1945, I received a large batch of uh, material from uh, uh, the Josiah Macy, uh, Macy Foundation which included several articles by an Army Colonel, uh, SLA Marshall, Slam Marshall as he was known. Although I did not know it at the time, Marshall had been with my battalion the night of the Banzai charge on Macon, or most likely arrived very early the next morning. And uh, he uh, had written a, n a number of articles describing his experiences, and uh, one of the a descriptions that he gave was of the Macon uh, attack, uh, or the attack upon this group. And uh, he reviewed it quite accurately, it seemed to me. And uh, he had been interested uh, since World War I, actually, in what he called problems of uh, command in minor tactics and the ratio of uh, fire ratios under fi combat conditions. He had uh, interviewed uh, frontline soldiers, or he'd worked out a process for interviewing frontline soldiers uh, all over the, the uh, uh, well, all throughout the uh, uh, European campaign and throughout uh, the Pacific. And uh, what he found was, after interviewing some 400 companies who's, uh, the, the men who were supposed to fight, it was their job to shoot their rifles, he discovered that only 15% normally, uh, no more than 25% ever fired their rifles. When they had opportunities to do so, they could see Japanese out there, but they just refused to fire. And uh, so that obviously poses a very real problem for uh, training soldiers. And uh, as I understand it, <clears throat> now things began to improve as far as the Army was concerned by uh, Vietnam when it's something like 85% uh, of the soldiers actually fired their uh, weapons. And then I'm sure by Iraq they must be pretty close to 95% from, from all I can hear. But uh, what his final conclusion was that uh, people were simply uh, as afraid of uh, killing other people as they were afraid of dying. And none of these people, none of these soldiers that, who refused to fire were malingerers, he pointed out. Uh, they just were, they were risking their lives and they died, but they simply couldn't kill other people. And uh, it's, this is interesting in a way from the point of view of uh, people in Seattle. I'm not native to Seattle, but uh, it's interesting because I, as I understand it, 
uh, John Marshall, the, grand, the, the grandson of uh, uh, Slam Marshall, is uh, an investigative reporter for the post intelligencer uh, paper. And uh, he wrote a very interesting book several years ago in which he described his, uh, his grandfather. And uh, but I won't go into that because it's quite a long discourse. Anyhow, uh, I'd like to move on to a, another part, another letter, uh, which is, uh, was written describing uh, the situation uh, off of Guam just before the landing on Guam. And uh, that, uh, it, we, had, we were aboard an LST off Guam in July 20, 1944. Tomorrow is the day, I wrote to my parents. These are, there are so many things I want to say and I can't think of a thing. This one, I fear, will be full-sized and I should be, have plenty of time for thoughts amidst the bursting of shells. I think that's what follows. Uh, bursting of shells. In my pack are a book of poetry of uh, a Galsworthy novel, one of Jane Austen's, and Conrad's Lord Jim. I see the news in, uh, the, in the news that Arn Anderson, Anderson ran the mile in uh, 4.1.6. Uh, That's really going. The show is within sight now. The flashes of gunfire over the horizon. I asked a man today what he was fighting for. He didn't know, being a professional soldier. Then I asked him why he hates the Japs because they're a different color, speak a different language, because they can't understand, I can't understand them. Well, he's honest anyway. I'm about to give in, give up all this and come home. The usual small signs of nervousness uh, in anticipation before battle are becoming evident in everyone. The night before is of particular interest to me. One person reads, one person sleeps, another worries uh, about the heat, another walks around drinking coffee, some talk, pick up this, drop that, and my mind wanders so much I can hardly write words, much less anything sensible. My usual reaction is to get, get sleepy and then not be able to sleep, but here's to try anyway. Moving on to uh, in the middle of the Battle of Guam, I'd like to read one section. Uh, after a few days of being pinned down, the CP was uh, able to move up forward. As we walked along the littered road, we came under artillery fire and we all dived into the ditches beside the road, each of us struggling to get under someone else and have the shelter of somebody else's body. It is sickening what one will do out of fear and to stay alive. From there, we went, moved forward to the end of the peninsula with no res uh, resistance except snipers. Beside one blockhouse, I came upon 11 dead Japanese, one without a head, another with his guts spilled out in his hands, another with a foot and an arm blown off, another with an, an empty skull, another with no marks, except a small hole just over his ear. All of their clothes had been blown off. As I stood looking at that heap of clay, when I, the thought came to me that I should be sick at my stomach. But I pushed it out of my mind and started imprinting the picture indelibly in my mind. Then the thought came to me, am I responsible for this carnage? I had been uh, spotting fire from the cruiser onto these very blockhouses. That night, we uh, established another CP. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I walked uh, further past the bodies and looked down upon a leg with leggings and two-toed shoe lying there in the middle of the trail, nothing else. That is what a strange sight. It had been blown off just above the knee and the owner was nowhere around. Uh, I wrote many letters from uh, Iwo Jima 
because I, I mean my practice no normally was to write a letter which summarized uh, any one group of letters that had to do with a particular battle and I would uh, write a summary letter of the, of, of Kiska, a summary letter of Macon, a summary letter of uh, Guam. But when it came to Iwo Jima, I guess I got tired and I just wrote a series of letters throughout the uh, operation, many of them from foxholes, so to speak. And uh, so I'll only read one, uh, which uh, I wrote just before the landing on Iwo Jima, and then I'll read one uh, right after the Iwo Jima when I was answering questions to my father when I wrote home. Uh, this is a troop ship off Iwo Jima, February 19, 1945. Here it is again, as you will have guessed by now, by the time this reaches you. The last three letters of this sort have com completely drained me, and I'm practically, I have practically nothing to say. We land on Iwo Jima probably the day after tomorrow, this time, I have no feeling at all. I know what to expect and have only intense fear, disgust, and hate for the next few days. Never in my life have I hated so much the thought of something I knew that I would have to do. It is entirely new emotion, although the beginnings of it were apparent in the last operation. The only bright spot, if it may be termed bright, is that the tremendous slaughter will take place only in a few days stretched out to 20, 26 or 30 days actually. Also, since I'm a regimental gunfire officer, this time I should be well back behind the front lines instead of virtually in them, as was often the case when I was attached to a battalion. And reading from a later letter, <clears throat> uh, I'm taking it from the middle, I had the doubtful pleasure of recommending for a silver star one of my spotters who was killed. So his wife gets two little pieces of metal plus a dog tag in return for her husband. His mother doesn't get anything for her son. There were 15 casualties in my team, and f including four dead. I have a fine tent mate in a typical rising young businessman he is the kind of a boy my mother would, any mother would be delighted to have as a son-in-law, a steady churchgoer, a naval officer, a fraternity man, owner of his own dry cleaning establishment in civilian life. He, is a fine, he has a fine collection of Jap teeth, personally acquired by vying with the maggots swarming in and out of uh, rotting Jap heads. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. He is a nice man, though. I heard from Jack yesterday. He has a guard company in San Diego. Thanks for the clipping, Mama. No, I didn't run into anybody from Stillwater on Iwo Jima. <laughs> and then finally, one uh, section, which is a comment upon the whole business at that point, uh, which uh, has to do what I think of as a relativity of war. Again, I am reminded of what I think of as the relativity of war. For me, Kisco, with no Japanese defenders, had been a real battle. Macon, as significant as ter Tarawa. And Guam, I guess nobody recognizes the word Tarawa anymore, but uh, Tarawa was about 100 miles either north or south, I can't remember which, from uh, Macon. And uh, at that point, it was the bloodiest battle that the Marines had engaged in up to that point, up to that time. At any rate, uh, Macon, as significant as Tarawa, and Guam, it was hell. When I look back on Iwo Jima, I know it was not the Fifth Corps that won the presidential citation, although the upper echelons in the Corps served their important functions. It was primarily the officers and men at the company and platoon levels, the men in direct contact with the enemy who really won the presidential citation. Now, uh, at various times, I was uh, under heavy, some, some heavy, sometimes constant artillery and mortar barrages, as well as machine gun ri and rifle fire. 
I underwent Banzai and counterattacks. I was virtually blown up on Iwo Jima. But my war experiences cannot compare with that of the individual uh, frontline platoon or squad leader and rifleman blowing up bunkers, flame-throwing pillboxes, killing in close proximity, often in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Killing at a distance, as when calling down fire from a destroyer or a cruiser, or a pill, on a pillbox, or a concentration of men, is not killing up close, where you see and even feel the men you kill. I was lucky. I remember the captain of the cannon company, the morning after he knifed to death one of his own men during the Banzai attack on Macon. He was no more than 30 yards or, more, or so away from me, but that distance may as well have been uh, a mile in terms of our individual experiences that night. And I will never forget the first day on Guam, hearing the bullets whispering by as I lay safely in a crater at the bata uh, battalion CP and watched Japanese banzaiing over a ridge some 500 yards or so away. Some waving swords, some stabbing with bayonets, others tossing grenades, and Marines engaging them in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, killing them as they were themselves were being killed on the side of that ridge, so close yet so far away from those of us in the CP. There's nothing novel in the observation that only a very small minority of the men in uniform during World War II ever saw combat, and even a smaller minority ever saw it at its essence at the cutting edge of the front lines. But veterans and civilians alike often forget that the experience of wars are relative. A few, years by, a few uh, yards behind the front line is not the same as in the front lines, and the difference increases exponentially, uh, echelon after echelon, from battalion CP to regimental CP to division to corps headquarters, finally to on shipboard to Hawaii, and finally <coughs> to the mainland of the uh, United States and the White House. Uh, at this point, I'll move on to the now part of the book a little bit, and I hope I'm not running too far over time. Uh, the now section of the book begins with uh, my experience in reading the letters some 60 years later, for the first, some 40 years later, actually, after I wrote them. As I read the letters, I found large gaps in my memory, which... Uh, I feel in an attempt to fill the gaps in my memory and to understand my war, I began to read widely, compulsively, at first histories of campaigns in which I participated, then books about other campaigns and about the larger picture of war in the Pacific, then books about the origin of the war in Europe and events leading to the United States, leading the United States into the war books about ending the war in the Pacific, books questioning the unprovoked surprise, uh, that is the supposed unprovoked uh, surprise attack off Pearl Harbor, and books questioning why the atomic bombs were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Finally, more general histories, memoirs, novels, not only of World War I, but of the Civil War, World War I, the Vietnam, uh, but especially memoirs of World War II, such as Robert Lakey's Helmet for My Pillow, William Manchester's Goodbye Darkness, E.B. Sledge's The Old Breed, Samuel Hines' Flights of Passage, Cy Khan's uh, Between Tedium and Terror, and many others. I wanted to see how other men had reacted to their wartime experiences on islands in the Pacific, how those experiences affected them, affected their memories, their thoughts, their attitudes, perhaps their lives. I wanted to compare their beliefs not only with the, about the good war, but about the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor and the need for atomic bombs at the end of, uh, uh, at the, end of the war to mine. What I found uh, was, after reading many memoirs, was my views about the war uh, are often quite different from those of veterans, 
of uh, other veterans. And it is evidence, too, from what uh, appears in the media and many books that most Americans are too often influenced by what uh, many of those veterans have said in years since about World War II. Uh, this raises one question which I had about in this book that uh, I, I don't believe in writing a memoir that it's really necessary to include footnotes. But uh, since I was dealing with something highly controversial, really, in my attitudes about the war as they developed from my reading, from the, uh, the attitudes of most uh, veterans and most Americans, I think, uh, I figured I ought to be able to cover myself. And so I did decide to include uh, footnotes uh, and references to uh, all, many of the books that I read and many other books I haven't mentioned here. Uh, also, uh, what became clear uh, in uh, reading all of this was that, uh, oh, I want to read <laughs> what I was thinking about. I, I'm just kind of lost at this point, I guess. Um, in, 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 the, in all of the reading that I did, I came, I, I came up with a conclusion that, uh, well, it's not my conclusion, actually, but uh, the problem of memory. And uh, uh, people 40 years later remember things quite differently in many different ways. And, uh, for example, uh, James, uh, James Michener uh, is, was quoted in a Newsweek article in which he said that uh, in all of my years uh, uh, in the Army, some three years in the Army, I never heard a single man uh, complain about what he was doing at all. And then five page la uh, pages after that, I came across Gore Vidal, who says, in all the years I had in the war, I never read across, came across a single good word about that war. <laughs> So this poses a very real problem for historians because uh, they, after all, have to depend to a large extent upon letters and diaries and memoirs, as well, of course, archived material. Because you can't read a set of letters and uh, take them literally. You can't read a memoir and take what you read literally. Uh, and the same thing's true of diaries as well. So. Uh, but, of course, by comparing back and forth, they eventually can arrive at some notion of what actually happened. Another thing that became clear in the course of uh, my reading these books was that there are two memories of World War II, which I've alluded to already in a way, uh, a, a traditional memory and uh, what is sometimes called a revisionist memory, which I prefer to call a uh, consensus memory. Uh, writing uh, now, uh, writing about war now, uh, I covered three main topics in the now section of the book. One, the good war, and the traditional view uh, is, of course, that the war was a good war, the last war we could all be proud of. Actually, the war, I can't see how it could be a good war at all when 400,000 Americans were killed and literally millions of uh, Europeans and Japanese and people throughout the Pacific were killed and other reasons as well. Also, the traditional belief see, uh, suggests that uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor was a surprise. And it was not a surprise to the uh, administration in Washington at all. It was a surprise, of course, to most American people. And it was a surprise to the soldiers who, I mean, and uh, Navy people who underwent, underwent it. But uh, the people in Washington uh, had already broken the uh, Japanese diplomatic code, and they had a pretty good notion of what was going on. And uh, so they knew that something was going to happen. And Roosevelt assumed that it probably would have been a bombing of uh, the Philippines. Uh, and then so some people thought it could very well be a bombing of Pearl Harbor. As early as, uh, uh, <coughs> as, early as uh, January of 1940, 
uh, whatever it was, 45. Uh, Secretary Knox wrote a letter to uh, the Secretary of Defense, <coughs> Stimson, and uh, suggested that there very well could be an, a, a bombing of Pearl Harbor with the Japanese approaching on uh, ships uh, from the Northwest, which in fact they actually did. And then some historians have gone to the extreme of suggesting that Roosevelt knew that the bombing was going to take place on Pearl Harbor. But in my view of what I've read at any rate, that's a little bit far-fetched. He, after all, had been Assistant Secretary of Navy, and I'm sure he's not going to look forward to having his Navy sunk in Pearl Harbor at the time. Uh, but at any rate, <coughs> excuse me, uh, many books since 1950s have questioned the need for the bombing of, per, uh, I mean, the use of, of uh, atomic bombs. The traditional view is that uh, in the summer of 1945, Truman had only one choice, invade Japan with the loss of uh, anywhere of hundreds of thousands of lives up to a million lives, or use the atomic bombs. Uh, but as I started to say, many historians since 1950 have uh, questioned the need for the bombs. And I'll read a short selection having to do with that. Uh, here. What eventually did give me reason to quite, well, I'll begin f uh, farther up and say that for a long time, I also believed that the bombs were necessary and that they saved uh, lives, including my own, because as far as I, we, uh, those of us who were in San Diego at the time, at the amphibious base training uh, naval gunfire teams, we assumed that we would probably have to go to Japan one way or another. Uh, but what eventually did give me reason to question uh, Truman's uh, decision was reading what many historians professional scholars who have spent many years studying primary sources uh, and have, uh, have to say about Truman's decision. Scholars such as Robert Buto, Buto I guess it is, who is, as I understand it, was a uh, member of the department at the University of Washington for a long time, probably retired now. Herbert Feiss, Martin Sherwin, John Dower, McGeorge Bundy, J. Samuel Walker, Robert Lifton and Greg Mitchell, Barton Bernstein, John Skates, Gara Alperovitz, among many others. The consensus today among these historians is that the bombs were not necessary to end the war. An invasion of Kyushu would uh, likely not have taken place, much less an invasion of Honshu. Japan would have surrendered even if the Russians had not declared war on Japan about the time the second bomb fell on Nagasaki and other possible ways of ending the war known to President Truman and his advisors were not pursued. Furthermore, uh, if the invasion had taken place, which it probably would not, there would not have been the tremendous casualties that uh, Stimson and Truman and others had suggested. That is, uh, hundreds of thousands up to <coughs> a million. <coughs> Excuse me. If you stop and think about it, there were 400,000 dead up to a million casualties in all theaters in four years of the war. So it seems highly unlikely that a million casualties would have taken place in the landing of Japan. Uh, the consensus historians have uh, often been contemptuously referred to as revisionists and have been accused of rewriting history. Uh, the term revisionist is, uh, when applied to historians, is uh, usually misleading because it implies that the historian is wrong to re rewrite history. But this is, the mis this is a mistake. It's the function of historians to rewrite history as new evidence becomes available. And uh, also, I guess, as new generations with new generation awareness become available. Uh, and uh, we see the same thing happening today I, I, about rewriting history. President Bush, and I'm quoting here, says, uh, it is deeply irresponsible to rewrite history 
or how the war began. In other words, talking about the Iraq War and what we're bege what is beginning to say, be said about that. Uh, there's one other element uh, which I have ad which I would add to the uh, notion of the uh, greatest of the uh, traditional view of war, and that's called the greatest generation's view or the view of the people who fought the war as being the greatest generation. Not only do veterans continue to justify and glorify World War II and their participation in it, but younger Americans who followed them also both glorify that war and venerate the generation that fought the war as the greatest generation. Tom Brokaw's Panglossian description of uh, my generation in his book the greatest generation, though well-intentioned, ignores such evidence, much evidence that many American soldiers and Marines on many occasions could be just as savage as the Japanese soldiers. Americans con uh, commonly killed enemy prisoners of war in cold blood or shot wounded Japanese or Japanese soldiers attempting to surrender. Americans strafed Japanese lifeboats full of men from bombed or sinking ships, as the first George Bush, included as one of Brokaw's uh, greatest, appears to have done according to a battle action report reproduced in Harper's Magazine. Uh, Americans killed Japanese parachuters from uh, uh, par Japanese parachuting from burning planes that had been shot down. Our ghoulishness was hardly anything to be proud of. Many Americans American young men vied with the maggots to collect small bags of gold teeth from the jaws of dead Japanese or even from those of Japanese still alive and thrashing about, as described so vividly in E.B. Sledge in his uh, memoir, The Old Breed, uh, where a, a soldier was, uh, a Marine was trying to uh, get the uh, uh, gold teeth out of the jaw of a wounded Japanese, as I say and he was digging with his knife and it slipped and he slit it, uh, he ended up slitting the cheeks on each side of the Japanese and then put his foot on the lower jaw and started digging to get the uh, gold tooth out. Finally, a, another Marine came up and shot the guy uh, to put him out of his misery. Uh, the collection of ghoulish souvenirs, including ears and other appendages, was far from uncommon. Even Japanese heads were sometimes boiled to remove the flesh so that skulls could be displayed or sent home as souvenirs, as illustrated in the famous, uh, or at least was then, picture in Life magazine of an attractive young woman uh, contemplating the polished skull of a Japanese head. As I think about the past actions of some members of my generation, the nation is reeling from the pictures of atrocities perpetrated by smiling Americans, soldiers in Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, and we are becoming uh, more aware of the not so well publicized vicious actions against civilians by some of our troops in Iraq. President Bush's remark that uh, what happens that Ab happened in Abu Ghraib is uh, not the American way, is naive and extreme. Uh, it's not the uh, way of any civilized nation, country for that matter. But what does he expect when men and new now women are trained to the in the military to hate and to kill, strip off the thin veneer of civilization from any group of men and women and free them from the restraints of society and there will always be many American soldiers and Marines, not to mention civilians who commit atrocities of all kinds during war and in every war. Like all people and nations, we Americans still think it is necessary to mythologize our past, to ignore many of the evils in our past, in order to legitimize our present and our greatness.
most of my generation and the generations that have followed mine seem to have forgotten that my greatest generation created the, the most monstrous evil imaginable. Uh, the means to annihilate every individual on earth, our species, and the earth itself as we know it. All humankind will now live eternally under that threat, as has been suggested by uh, Bush. Uh, to finish, I would like to read one section from uh, the uh, chapter which is uh, concerned about the war in my life. Now, as winter relentlessly approaches and the snow deepens and high up in the mountains, I continue to set out alone for a few hours each morning, shouldering my pack and my rifle, taking my ski pole cane in hand to search for one last elk somewhere in the El Subalpine firs, higher up on a ridge behind my sheep herder's wagon. That's my uh, Alaskan camper, which looks like a sheep herder's wagon in many respects. Uh, pushing several shells into the magazine of my 30 6 and finally one into the breech and closing the bolt, I'm reminded of my war. I remember awakening one dawn, one long, long time before dawn, uh, one morning, camped at my camper at the trailhead of Teepee Creek to the sounds of, uh, all around me, of uh, squeaking leather of movement here and there, stamping feet, mutterings, mumblings, curses, strapping on gear, rifles clicking closed as hunters moved off in the dark up the trail in twos and threes to look for elk. As I listened, I could hear again the preparations of soldiers for going over the right sides of the troop ship and down the landing nets, or the muffled sounds of Marines as we moved off into the dark to take up a position farther forward. Another day, high up on the ridge, of the, uh, high up on the side of a ridge, at school, above Schoolmarm Gulch, a fusillade of uh, bullets fired at deer from below whispered past my head as I died for an enfilade, and I remember many of times on Macon, on Guam, on Iwo Jima, and my orange hunting cap gave me the same sense of uh, security as my metal helmet in battle. One afternoon, while hunting spring black bear, I stood under a large fir tree to avoid the rain, hearing in the distance the roll of thunder approaching, and then the crashing and crackling of, of uh, lightning and the thunder all around me. I was reminded of the crash and crack of artillery shells exploding around me on islands in the Pacific. And as the thunder moved farther away, I thought, someone else is getting it now and thank the good Lord that it was over, at least for the time. I felt a wartime thrill of danger one day when armed only with bow and arrow, I slowly came to realize that I, had follow, I was following the trail of a bear through chest-high grass, a grizzly bear actually, into a dense grove of trees. I see the same shape of death in the animals I kill on a, as I saw in the human, human animals lying motionless, torn by bullets and for shell fragments on Macon, Guam, and Iwo Jima. On occasion I have shot an elk or a Rocky Mountain sheep only to knock it down wounded. When I come upon the animal and force myself to shoot it behind the ear to put it out of its misery, I am reminded of the time I saw uh, or observed a Marine point his uh, M1 rifle at a wounded Japanese soldier and pull the trigger. As I remembered, and I remembered once when I was struggling with my hunting knife to cut out the ivories from the jaw of a bull elk, a vivid memory of the young, fresh-faced ensign whom I mentioned before, a shore fire control officer, with a small bag of gold teeth he had managed to dig out of the jaws of dead Japanese he came upon in the fighting, uh, was when the fighting was over in Iwo Jima. And I am reminded of wartime fear by the fear I feel now when I set out on to climb a ridge at the age of 78, wondering if I will have the strength to find my way back alive as I move farther and farther away from my camp. A broken hip, a heart attack. As I become older, I find myself becoming more timorous when I follow steep, narrow, snowy logging roads or trails 
into unfamiliar country or climb str uh, strange ridges, especially at high altitudes and the wind blowing, isolated and alone. I have to push myself to keep going up, but having pushed myself up to the top of a new ridge and sinking down in the snow for a moment, I feel comfortable, elated, and I recall forcing myself to move forward, leading my men, my radio team, across the dried, cracked rice paddy on Guam when I could hear, literally, and feel the bullets whistling, whispering by, uh, and then the comfort I felt as I fell safely into the shell crater near my CP. So the war goes on and on and on. That one does, and it does for other soldiers, World War I, Vietnam War and it will for the Iraq uh, veterans as well. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for my voice. I just couldn't make it work tonight. <laughs>